in terms of the uh, of this added topic, I, I had quite a few people ask me about experimental medicines and therapies, and the. Um, this is a, uh, I also have a note actually on the previous section, I got a, uh, a private message from someone here that the blanket DNR is currently being discussed in town, uh, in Toronto at Baycrest, so this, uh, this could be a, uh, a real issue. The, uh, but in terms of the experimental medicines and therapies, I had quite a few people ask me about this, and I wanted to stay away from it. Um, it's really its own issue, and it's a very large issue. It's not simple and, uh, and straightforward. Um, I gave you on the sheet, for those who have the one that I sent out today, not the original one, but the one I sent out today and that I put on the chat in the beginning today, in source number 38, I gave you links. One is to our 2016 session regarding vaccinations, and one to our 2014 discussion regarding rejecting medical advice. Um, and both of those, I dealt with with some of these issues, in, uh, you know, and uh, to a to a greater extent. It's a really hard topic. Um, the question has come up most famously, I think, in terms of hydroxychloroquine. Um, you know, I read article after article after article, and it's all over the place. I've seen people say it may help. I've seen people say it increases the risk of cardiac events. I've seen people say it can interact with other drugs. Um, there was an article in the Globe and Mail about vision. Um, there's the concern that this is needed for people with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there have not been proper double-blind studies, and on and on. And I, it's an important question, which is why I ultimately agreed to, to have a discussion about it. But it's a really hard question. That the, it's not only about the, um, the hydroxychloroquine. Um, I've seen this also regarding vitamins, um, and I've seen it also regarding melatonin. And there's a doctor who's on our medical email list. I don't know if he's on the, uh, the, the call right now. But um, but the you are here. So um, Dr. Pupko. Oh, I see you there. Okay. So um, yeah, uh, he has a blog called Medical Imagineering, um, and uh, he asked me specifically to mention the melatonin idea. I am not calling for input here on it. The um, I had a terrible experience because I put the question of whether to take experimental therapies. On, um, on a rabbinic list serve that I'm on to put it to a, to a halachic authority. And I was inundated by rabbis with anecdotal reports from their communities of what's being done and what they've seen recommended and what the doctors in their shul say, none of which was what I was looking for. The, um, the, the, I, I will leave it to the doctors to, to discuss this in terms of... Um, in terms of, of the medical aspect of it. But the question that we do have to ask is, what does Halacha say on trying such treatments? Everybody is aware, I hope, certainly the healthcare professionals, that there are no guarantees in medicine. So much so, if you look at source number 39, I brought you the Ramban, who talks about the Torah's mitzvah of rapo yirape. Right? The Torah tells us that if you wound somebody, if you injure somebody, then you also have to pay their medical bills, from which we understand that there's such a thing as the practice of medicine within Torah, within Jewish law. And that's a, uh, yeah, Ramban says, what this is telling me, the, uh, and Rav Cook in number 40 expands on the idea that the, the, the doctor practices and the doctor does the best that he is able to do with the evidence in front of her, in front of him. And if there's a mistake, if something goes wrong, that's covered by, it's effectively an indemnification. It's covered by the imperative to heal. But you do the best you can do. And you know there are no certainties when it comes to medicine. But how far can you extend that? When you have certain protocols for determining that something works, how far can you go to say, yeah, but I'm willing to bend it in a case of emergency? So normally, we would have to start by distinguishing between two different kinds of situations. Experimental interventions that don't involve saving lives and experimental interventions that do involve saving lives. 
Vaya, but here, I think we consider COVID-19 a threat to life, regardless of whether we're talking about a vaccine, an early therapy, a last-ditch therapy, doesn't make a difference because of the unpredictable ways in which the virus travels and the speed with which it kills, we consider all of these to be life and death possibilities. So the question of what the level of need is, is not, uh, is not so relevant um, right now. So what do we do? So I want to look at this first from the point of view of the medical professional. And the question is, would prescribing an experimental treatment or an unproven treatment be A, prohibited, B, permitted, or C, obligatory? And again, I refer you back to my disclaimer in the beginning. None of this is PSOC, none of this is medical advice. But the way you, dis- you determine whether it's prohibited, permitted, or obligatory is to boil it down to three questions. One, the question we asked before, is there a major medical need? And our answer here is yes. Number two, is there objective reason to think that this will work? Now, what does that mean? What counts in halacha as an objective reason to think that this is going to work? So halacha has a few different possible criteria. Number one, promotion by certified experts. uh, This is something that goes way, way back within halacha. The idea that we go with experts, the tour, based on the Ramban, says you go to those who know chokma sarafua who know the science of healing, so that I brought you the Chidah, then source number 41, of Chaim Yosef David Azulai, who's quoting the Ma'aril from, I think, 14th century Germany, who says, today, when no one may treat without license from their scholars, all who are involved in treating are called experts. You want board certification. Are they certified to be able to treat? Rav Yaakov Emden, in his Moruk Tzia, in the... Um, in the 18th century, said, you go with an expert's prescription. Rav Moshe Feinstein in the 20th century says, if a doctor says something has an overwhelming chance of success, no, overwhelming chance of success, we have to come back to that, he says, then you must use it. Ditto Rav Eliezer Waldenberg, that sits Eliezer in, uh, in source number 42. He used the accepted medical approach. Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach is quoted in the Nishma Safram as well. Of course, all of that leads to the question that I put on the rabbinic list serve today, which is, what about where the experts disagree? It's all well and good to say, ask the experts, but uh, we've got a wealth of experts. We have no shortage of experts. The problem is they're not on the same page. So, the, uh, so one view is to say, get the greatest. Just ask the greatest one. I realize that that's easier said than done. But, uh, but ask the greatest one. After all, the Shulchan Aruch of Yosef Karo in source number 43 says, you're supposed to only involve yourself in medication, in medicine, if you are the greatest one around. Which means all of you are the greatest, right? Because how else would it work? So Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg asked, if the Shulchan Aruch is serious that you have to be the greatest, how is it that all of us practice medicine? Not us, all of you practice medicine. So Rabbi Waldenberg in source number 42, um, sorry, source number 44, says, you can't really tell me that everybody has to go to the greatest medical professional. He won't be able to take her. She won't be able to take care of, uh, of everybody. So that's why you have multiple practitioners, but you go with the greatest one that you can actually consult. And that's one school of thought. Another school of thought is to say, work with the significant majority opinion. Try to find consensus. Rav Yaakov Reicher, in source number 45, authored a responsum in which he said, what we want is a recognizable majority. If two-thirds of physicians, two-thirds of medical professionals are going to recommend this, that's something that we will go with. Classically, we have prioritized local experts, which is based on the language of the Rambam in source number 46. He says, you go with Rofei Uman Shal Oso Makom, the local expert. The, uh, that's the Rambam statement. The Sefer Ramanucha on the Rambam says that's because the Torah says when it comes to judges, you go to the judge who was around in those days. So... Whoever's around in those days means whoever's around locally. I find it hard to actually define what locally means in our day. 
I don't know what locally means anymore. Everybody's consulting people around the world. They go online and they try to read things on scholar.google.com and I'm reading things at, at, you know, out of the Far East. I don't know what local means. They, um, but the point that I'm trying to express here is that when we say that a treatment um, has support within halacha because it is put forth by, um, by experts... That's something that is an old tradition in Torah, that we would go indeed with the experts, and where the experts disagree, we're going to try to get the greatest, and we're going to try to find consensus. However, expertise is not the only criterion here. Where there is logical theory behind something, where you can make the scientific argument that something should work, or where experience is that something works, then there's also grounds to use it. The Rambam in the Mora Nebuchim, in the Guide of the Perplexed, in source number 47, where I brought you the Hebrew from one edition, obviously, again, his original one was Aramaic, as I noted when we began this. But the, uh, but the Rambam says specifically that anything, the end of source number 47, anything proven by experience may be practiced, even where logic doesn't dictate it. So he wants you to use things that are logical. That's really his preference. However, he's willing to go with that which is supported by experience as well. Rav Nachum Rabinovich, who um, also is in need of a refuah shlema, not from COVID-19, but I got a message today that uh, he's also in need of a, uh, of a refuah shlema. If I remember the name right now, I would tell it to you. I think it's Nachum Eliezer ben Miriam Sara, someone like that. But the um, but uh, but he took the position that where something is supported based on experience, that would indeed be grounds for uh, for supporting it. And the Chassam Sofer says, test, look for experience by 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 actually testing. I brought it in number forty eight. He said experience is a more honest witness than all the theories founded upon proofs. So, the, um, so, again, bigger picture here. We said our first question when it comes to an untested or unproven treatment is, what's the level of need? Our second question is, is there objective basis for thinking that this would work based on expertise, based on consensus, based on theory, based on experience and testing? That's what we are looking for. But the last question is also really important here. And that is, is there a risk of harm in treating this patient? Harm to others and harm to this patient. Oh, thank you. Uh, someone sent me the, uh, the name for Rabinovich, Rav Nachum Eliezer ben Sarah Miriam. Thank you. Okay. The, um, so first of all, in terms of harm to others, so we have concerns that are more direct and we have concerns that are less direct. If we talk about specifically the hydroxychloroquine, the, um, you have the concern for direct harm by shortages of the drug for people who need it for lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, we also have the indirect concern that you reduce attention to other potential therapies if people are going to invest in this. The, um, so that's a, that's a concern. The, um, the, and that's you know, what comes under the harm to others consideration. However, if we think that this will actually work to save someone's life, then I go back to my triage rules, which say, save the patient in front of you. I'm not going to conserve this treatment from this patient in order to treat somebody with lupus. The patient in front of me is the one that I'm going uh, to be taking care of. However, if the reason to use it is, well, why not, then I think you do need to become more cautious about causing harm to, uh, to others, and that becomes more of a factor. But beyond the harm for others, there's the question of harm to this patient. Again, going back to the hydroxychloroquine, so we've noted that there are fears of cardiac damage, there are fears about drug interactions. However, in truth, we have a very long history of accepting the unknown danger that is inherent in medications, in therapies, and in their protective measures. I mentioned Rapo Yerape before. Um, Reversal Schefter in source number 49 is quoted regarding vaccination and the possibility that there may be a very, very small risk 
uh, with a uh, with a particular vaccine? And his answer is. If it's really such a tiny risk, then an individual who says, well, I am concerned about the one in a million risk, we say of him, Bala Daito. His position is not accepted within halacha. Now, I'm not equating, let me be very clear, I'm not equating vaccination with these kinds of... Um, with these, I'm not equating vaccination with these kinds of treatments. Vaccination has been tested over and over and over again. I am not um, equating the two. My point is only to say that the, um, that we do have a level of tolerance for risk when it comes to medical therapies. Rav Asher Bush, in an article on vaccination, noted that for centuries the sages have recommended fleeing cities in times of uh, in times of epidemic. Fleeing a city is also dangerous. So you can't say that we're unwilling to tolerate risk. But you need to know what the level of risk involved is compared to the dangers that you're trying to solve of uh, of COVID-19. And that's a very hard calculation. So I'm going to sum up what I'm saying on this um, and then add two more notes and then take the comments that I'm seeing building in the chat here. Okay? That's the, the way I'd like to, to go with this. So first of all, to sum up what I've said, if the treatment is for a serious medical need and it's promoted based on expert opinion, theory, experience, testing, and the risk level is low relative to the harm of the illness, then there is grounds for recommending it as the need or support for using it rises or the risk level drops, the grounds for recommending it grow, right? The, um, the greater the evidence on behalf of it, the grounds for recommending it grow. When I put my question out on the, um, on the list serve, uh, the rabbinic list serve, um, about the situation, so I got an answer from Rav Mordechai Willig um, saying that in the absence of medical consensus, the doctor has to formulate the, uh, the doctor's own opinion. Until you, uh, until you actually have a, uh, a medical consensus. But let's look at the other side, which is I'm talking about what the, uh, what the doctor is offering. What about the patient's perspective where the medical professional is actually offering it? Is the patient allowed to do it? Is the patient obligated to do it? How do we, how do we deal with that there? If it has a great likelihood of working and it's very low risk, then it becomes obligatory. If it has a possibility of working, but there is risk, then it becomes optional. Now, there's a whole other discussion about informed consent. I gave you a link in source number 50 for that discussion. But fundamentally, the treatment will be optional if the need is low. The, treat, the treatment is optional if there's objective reason to think that, in fact, the medical professional doesn't know. I brought you a Yaakov Emden on that point in number 51. If the medical professional acknowledges that it's a dangerous treatment, Ramosha Feinstein says again, then we're not going to push the patient to, uh, to do it. One last point on this. What if the patient wants the treatment and the medical professional thinks it's not indicated? What do you do then? You have a patient who has family in New York, and the patient says, you know, in New York, where they're dealing with COVID-19, they're giving people uh, ZPAC and hydro hydroxychloroquine, so you should give it to me. Um, you should give it to me as well. And the medical professional is of the opinion that it's not warranted. This is a hypothetical case. So now, what do you uh, now? What do you do? So I point you to the Magen Avram, Rabbi Avram Gambiner, in source number 53, who says, if a patient says, I need X medicine, and the doctor says, no, you don't, we listen to the patient. However, if the doctor says the medication would harm the patient, then we listen to the doctor. He says, if it's no harm... So go ahead. Now, he's dealing in a different medical world, let's be really clear, where the patient has some idea, you know, of what's going to work. The, um, that's not quite the same as what we've been, as what we've been uh, dealing with. But he's very clear that if there's a sense that this can be harmful, the patient has no say. It's the medical expert who, uh, who, who has to be the one to, uh, to weigh in. I actually spoke with a Dr. Avram Sofer Abraham about this, dealing with a different question years ago, where a patient wants antibiotics, 
and the medical professional thinks that it's not warranted. And he said, we don't rely, his words now, he said, we don't rely on quacks even though they are popularly accepted. That was his, um, that was his response in the case that I gave him back then. The, so that's, uh, that, and that's important as well. To, to, so to sum up what we're saying here on this last uh, issue, the experimental medicines, therapies, things that have not yet gone through clinical trials, um, what we're saying is this. From the medical professional's perspective, you have to ask, is there a major medical need? Is there some objective reason to think that this is going to work? And what is the level of risk of harm in providing this to the patient? Those are the three questions that, the, uh, that you're fundamentally going to need to answer to justify using this treatment. From the patient's perspective, the medical professional is offering it, and there's a great likelihood of it working, and it's very low risk, that it becomes obligatory to try it. However, if there's high risk or less reason to try it, then the patient has the option of saying no. And if the patient wants it and the medical professional thinks it's not indicated, so just not being indicated, maybe give it. But if it's harmful, that's a, uh, that's a different story. I'm going to look now at the comments in the chat. Hopefully they're not too harsh. The, um, I only added this addendum by request. Please keep that in mind. <laughs> All right. So first of all, Dr. Pupko gives his blog here regarding um, the melatonin, so people can look at it there. The, um, the, uh, and he asks whether, based on this discussion, a melatonin trial may be obligatory. I'm not poskening. I'm not uh, offering uh, halachic rulings on it, and I don't know enough of the medicine, in any case, to be able to speak knowledgeably about it. The harm, Barry Pecus, the harm of non-effective therapies and the hype around them also includes the population level harm of undermining the effective public health measures. Right. That was part of what I meant when I said that if people are going to focus and rely on this, then they're not necessarily going to invest in the proven therapies. And I think that's a big issue. Someone wrote to me privately, surely RCT have highest value to gain knowledge for future therapies that move evidence beyond anecdotal. What is RCT? I don't know. RCT, anybody? Um, S- control trial. Ah, have highest value to gain knowledge for future therapies that move evidence beyond anecdotal. Greater benefit for future over uncertain risk benefit. Absolutely. If we can get clinical trials, that would be great. Um, I think the discussion should be how it writes between the doctor and patient, and God willing, if there is enough anecdotal evidence, it should make it out to the public. This is a medical question, um, you know, fundamentally about how it's safest to conduct medicine. But I would be worried. Um, I would be worried about a system in which everybody is deciding this for themselves, um, you know, without some kind of way to tabulate, to collate and tabulate data. And my basis for that is not a medical statement as much as a halachic one, where we really do look towards the building of medical consensus. How do you build medical consensus if each one is operating on their own um, and without shared parameters? Um, One more message. No, two, three more messages. Okay. It is ethically unacceptable to give a patient a therapy without adequate evidence, without explicitly discussing that with them. So that's the informed consent point that I did raise. Informed consent is its own complication, Michael, in terms of how you're going to uh, deal with it, because it's hard to give proper information to give full information in the settings that we're talking about. The patients are not sitting you know, objectively in a, uh, you know, in a classroom. The, um, the patients are there in the hospital under tremendous stress. Giving proper, getting proper consent and giving proper information is a scary prospect, just you know, from, that, from that perspective. The other question is, so what constitutes adequate evidence in the mind of a desperate patient? That's also very hard. Um, someone else wrote to me, there is a distinction between unproven and experimental treatment. Is there a halachic difference? And the answer, I think, goes back to what I had said about what's considered acceptable criteria. Right? We're talking about accepting where there is a consensus, where experts say it, where there's experience. Um, these are much more in support of an unproven treatment, just hasn't had the trials, as opposed to something that's starting out as something experimental, I would think. The... Um, 
there's, there's much more to say with this. Um, I hope that, um, I hope that this has been helpful. Um, I really hope this has been helpful. Um, I, as I said in the very beginning, you know, at 8 o'clock, um, I, uh, I'm grateful to all the medical professionals who are taking care of this, who are, who are um, taking care of our community and communities beyond. Um, thank you very much. If I can be of help, I am glad to. Um, you know, let me know for anything other than PSAK. The, uh, for halachic rulings, um, ask your shul rabbi, go to your posek, uh, but that's not something that, I, uh, that I'm capable of, uh, of doing. I hope everybody will have a restful uh, rest of Yantiv. Hopefully it will not be exciting, and God willing, we will get through all of this. I expect to post the audio recording uh, online as well. Um, I may post the, um, the video one. I have to look at it first because I've never looked at a Zoom recording to see what it actually looks like. So I'll have to see. Um, but uh, we'll see. Thank you so much. Have a great night, a good Moed, a good Yantiv, and please stay well. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the thumbs ups. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And Brad, it's good to see you. Yeah, the next one is May 11th, God willing, on dental emergencies on Shabbos. That's the next session, God willing. Rabbi, thank you. Thank you, and thanks for your note. Joyce and somebody else together? Does not like Joyce and somebody else. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to take care of this. Thank you.